Matthew chapter number 15. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into what the Lord has for us from this particular passage of Scripture. Now, growing up, there was a place where I remember well, people from all white walks of life, all different types, were always welcome. And that was at my parents' dinner table. Now, I didn't appreciate it growing up. But looking back on it now, and uh, just thinking about how special it was, my parents' house was the place where everybody wanted to go. All my friends, people from our church, uh, we, we, we usually didn't go over to anybody else's house. It was usually the Burkett house where everybody came to. And uh, I remember uh, dear friends, family members, uh, church family members, and sometimes neighbors and complete strangers gathering around our table and uh, spending many, 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 uh, many times around that table in the presence of my parents and finding that it was a place where all different types of people were welcome to come. And as I thought about that particular place this week, it, it caused me to think that in a much grander sense, you know, Jesus has spread a spiritual table where he welcomes all people to come and die. Where he welcomes all people, no matter what their background is, no matter what their uh, sin may be in the past, Jesus welcomes all people to the feast at his table. And in this account of scripture that we're about to study, we see this truth conveyed to us very vividly. Jesus spreads a table, literally, in the wilderness to all the people who came to him. And that's what we see taking place in Matthew chapter number 15. And we're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 29. Before we read, understand this, just by way of review. Just before this, Jesus had ventured for the first time in his ministry beyond the borders of the nation of Israel. And he'd gone into the land of the Gentiles. And he began his Gentile ministry. Um, and uh, last week we saw from the beginning of this study that the first place Jesus went to was the western region of Tyre and Siren, where he healed the Syrophoenician woman's daughter from being demon possessed. And after he had gone to that, that region of, of Tyre and Sidon, from there Jesus headed back east through Syria. And then he came southward along the eastern coast of the Sea of Galilee to a region on the southwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, known as Decapolis, or some would say the Decapolis. And again, this was a region that was predominantly populated by Gentiles. They weren't Jewish people. They were all the others, all the other nations of people who populated this particular area. Now, interestingly, Decapolis is a name that means ten cities. And uh, its, its name was derived from the ten city state um, uh, uh, that, that it was named after. There were ten major cities uh, that uh, populated this particular region. And if you study your history, you'll find that uh, it was actually some old veterans from Alexander the Great's army that settled in that place. Later on, the Roman general Pompey um, formed it into a Roman region. There was a lot of rich history that took place in this particular region, but the emphasis is that the majority of the people that lived here were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. And so as Jesus continues on in his ministry, we find that he is still ministering to Gentile people in Gentile lands. Why is this significant to us? Well, historically, this is significant because to Jesus' disciples, the fact that Jesus would minister to Gentiles had to have been shocking to them. Because they had grown up in a culture where Jews didn't have anything to do with Gentiles. There was an inborn prejudice that Jewish people had to all the nations. They were superior. They didn't fraternize with people from other nations. And so imagine in the minds of these disciples how astounding it was that Jesus would leave Israel and begin ministering to Gentile nations. I want you to listen to me. In a very real sense, Jesus was demonstrating the truth of Romans 1 and verse 16. The Bible says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. How many are faithful the gospels for everybody today? Yeah. And so Jesus begins this ministry among the Gentiles. And he didn't really minister to the Gentiles very long during his earthly ministry. But he did so long enough to set the precedent. That his gospel was for all nations of people, every language, tribe, and tongue. 
What's interesting is when Jesus left the coast of Israel where he had been rejected, where they didn't want to accept his ministry, he steps on Gentile property. For the first time, he finds a people who are hungry to hear and to receive what he has to say. Last week, we heard from a woman who said, Jesus, if you'll just give me the crumbs of what you have to offer. She would settle for crumbs. She was so hungry for what Christ had to offer. And boy, when the Gentiles came for crumbs, Jesus decided he'd put out a full feast for them. And that's what happens in this passage of Scripture with the feeding of the 4,000. And so I want you to look at our text in Matthew 15, beginning in verse number 29. Here's what the Bible says. It says, And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh to the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. The great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples unto them and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness so as to fill so great a multitude? But Jesus saith unto them, Well, how many loaves have you? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they that did all eat were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. In this passage of scripture, we find that Jesus spreads a table to feed this multitude in the wilderness. And this is a table that he welcomes all different types of people to be able to come and enjoy what he has to offer. Here's the message in summary for us today. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. Jesus offers you a place at his table still today. If you will come. If you will come. The table that Jesus spreads is not physical. It's a spiritual table. And he invites you to come. Bring your emptiness. Bring your brokenness. Bring your desperation. Bring your sinfulness. Bring yourself right as you are right now. Come to him and let him give you true satisfaction to your soul. You've been trying to find fulfillment in every other place. And you haven't found it. But Jesus has it for you today. If you'll come take a seat at this table. As we think on this truth, I want us to pray and ask for God to speak to our hearts. I want to preach to you a message about how you need to come to the table. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you this morning and I pray that you will put a holy hush on this room. I pray, God, that you will open our hearts to receive your truth. And open our minds to dwell on your truth. And I pray, God, that you will use the truth of your word as you have spoken to my heart about it this week. I pray, God, that you would speak to the hearts of your people now as they hear the word presented. We know you promised it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you send it forth to accomplish. And I pray, God, that we would not stand in the way to a distracted mind or heart to the work that you'd like to do in our hearts today. And I pray, God, that you will give us alertness. I pray that you'd speak to us. And if there's one not saved, save them today, Lord. And if there uh, is one who is saved, Lord, they're not satisfied because they've been looking for fulfillment in other places besides you. I pray you'd revive their hearts and turn their eyes back on Jesus today. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, there are three encouraging truths that we learn here at the table of Jesus. Number one, the first truth I want you to write down is that Jesus saves. Will you say that out loud with me? Jesus saves. You see, Jesus saves all those who come and sit at his table. Now look back at verse number 29 with me in our text. In verse 29, the Bible says, Jesus departed from thence and came nigh to the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. 
So as Jesus enters this Gentile region of Decapolis, it didn't take long for the people who were there to find out that he was in town. Now, Mark's parallel account of this same story gives us some indication as to why. If you read in Mark 7, the Bible tells us that Jesus first healed a man who was a deaf mute. He couldn't hear, he couldn't speak, and when Jesus healed him so that he could hear and so that he could speak, news spread very fast. Even though Jesus had asked him not to tell anybody, he'd never heard anything, he'd never said anything, you better believe he couldn't shut up about what Jesus had done for him. All right? In Mark 7, verse 36, Jesus charged him that they should tell no man, but the more that he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. So as Jesus began to heal people, word got out very fast, Jesus was in town. And all of a sudden, when the people from that region realized that this Jewish Messiah had come to Gentile lands, they could not stay away because they'd heard about the great things that this man Jesus was able to do. <laughs> so the Bible tells us there in verse number 30 that they brought with them the lame and the blind and the dumb and the maimed and many others. Listen, any person with any type of physical or spiritual affliction, they were brought to Jesus. And uh, in particular, note the word maimed there in verse number, verse number 30. Uh, it comes from the Greek word kolos. It refers to any part of the, the human body that is deformed or uh, unable to be used, likely because of mutilation or total loss. And I like to imagine these things in my mind. This is the first time something like this is mentioned in the scripture. But imagine people coming, missing a body limb. And, and they come to Jesus for healing. And just imagine the creative power of Jesus. Where Jesus... Brings, bring, uh, bring, brings whatever appendage it may have been that was gone and puts it back on their body. That is just incredible to me. And it's no wonder people got so excited about the miraculous power of Jesus Christ here. But I love what the Bible says these people did. They brought all these people and the Bible says that they sat them down at Jesus' feet. They brought them and cast them down at Jesus' feet. The word cast there in verse 30 it gives the indication that they brought them with haste and they laid them down and then they left to go get more people. That's literally the indication of the word if you study it out. Can you imagine these people? They're coming from, from the cities. They're coming out in the wilderness to this mountain where Jesus is. And they just couldn't get the people to Jesus fast enough. They were hurrying along their way trying to get as many people as they could to Jesus. And let me preach for a minute here, church. Listen to me. Hey. That's the kind of fervency that you and I need to have about bringing people to Jesus as well. See, a lot of times we're slothful uh, when it comes to sharing our faith. And we're a little bit negligent when it comes to sharing our faith. But God help us to have the same kind of passion that these Gentiles had. That when they realized Jesus was in town, they went and found everybody they knew who needed healing. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast him down at Jesus' feet. Boy, you can imagine as people began to show up and people began to be healed, more people went out and very quickly this crowd grew and grew to several thousand people. Uh, the end of our text tells us that there were at least 400 men who were there, not counting the women and children. Conservatively speaking, it was, it was, this was a crowd of more than 12,000, could have been up to 20,000 people who were gathered on that mountainside as Jesus was ministering to them on this day. And here's the incredible thing. Listen, every person who was brought to Jesus was healed. There was not one condition that Jesus was not able to heal. Look at the end of verse 30 with me, where the Bible says, and he healed them. And he healed them. Listen, it didn't matter the condition. It didn't matter the situation. It didn't matter if the doctor said it was impossible or not. Every single disease and every single affliction that was brought to Jesus, he healed that affliction. And he healed that disease. And I'll tell you why. As Matthew Henry said, he said all diseases are at the command of Christ to come and go as he bids them. Let me tell you something. Jesus is very much in control. Yeah. In these past couple of weeks, we've seen several physical conditions happening to different people. And I'm going to tell you, there's so much that has happened. Even for you in this room, you've been sick. The doctors didn't give you much hope. And Jesus healed you. 
People ask me all the time, you believe that, that God still does miracles? Absolutely, I believe God still does miracles. And I'm thankful that we have a God who's still able to heal. That's what Jesus did for these people here. And so as the crowd grew and the miracles began to take place, it's no wonder that, at the, that, the, that the Bible says in verse 31, look at it with me. It says that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, and the maimed to behold, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Two, two things happened in their hearts as they saw the deliverance that Christ could bring, the salvation that Christ could bring. Their hearts were filled with wonder, and their hearts were filled with worship. You see, they wonder. That means to stand in awe. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. They'd never seen anything like it. And friend, it reminds me of what I see so many times in the church. As people get saved who were drunkards, who were drug addicts, who were, uh, who were lost in fornication and all types of debauchery and sinfulness. They get saved and Christ changes their life. And I just have to sometimes stand back and marvel at what Jesus can do in a person's life. Their hearts were filled with wonder, but their hearts were also filled with worship. You look at the end of verse number 31. The Bible says that they glorified, and say the name with me, the God of Israel. They glorified the God of Israel. Remember something? These were Gentiles. They didn't grow up learning about Jehovah God. They didn't grow up worshiping the Jews God, the God of Israel. They grew up worshiping their pagan gods, the Greek gods, and the Roman gods. And there was many of them. But all of a sudden, they saw Jesus' work. And their hearts were filled with worship for the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine such a thing? Friend, when you begin to see God work in your life, you too will be drawn to worship the one true God. And that is Jesus Christ. And that is Jesus Christ alone. Thank God. We see these people, as they came to Jesus, they discovered that he had the power to save them. Now listen to me. Jesus still has the power to save every single person who comes to him. That's the application. He still has the power to save every single person who comes to him. Bring your sins. Bring your troubles. Bring your worries. Bring your desolation. Bring your depression. Bring your loneliness. Bring your issues. Whatever they may be today, Jesus has the power to save you. He can take care of every single one of them. Listen, the Bible says in Hebrews 7, in verse 15, that He is able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by Him. And there is no such thing as too great of a sinner for Jesus to be able to save. Amen. Here's another application for you. Every single person needs to learn the lesson to bring your troubles to the feet of Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus can save. Why are you trying to save yourself? Why are you trying to take care of it yourself? When the lesson all the while is bring your trouble to the feet of Jesus. Because that's the only place where it can truly be taken care of. If you are a sinner, you've been trying to clean yourself up. You've been trying to make yourself worthy for God. You'll never do it. So what do you do? Bring your sin to the feet of Jesus and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior today. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Thank God we have a God named Jesus Christ who is able to save. If you're a Christian, you don't need to stop bringing your trouble to the feet of Jesus. In fact, all the more so you should know that's exactly what you should do. And yet so often we try to carry our burdens on our own. Jesus says, won't you come lay him down at my feet? Cast all your care upon him. Why, church? Because he cares for you. Psalm 55 and verse 22 says, Cast thy burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Christian, can I ask you? Do you need to bring something to the feet of Jesus today? See, you're welcome with the place at Jesus' table. And at Jesus' table, what you'll find, first of all, is that Jesus saves. Thank God for it. Number two, at Jesus' table, what you'll find is that Jesus serves. Jesus serves. See, Jesus serves all those who come to his table. Now this multitude was so massive that came to Jesus. The Bible indicates that it took three whole days for Jesus to minister to all this, uh, this uh, mass of people. And after three days, notice what happened in verse 32. 
In verse 32, the Bible says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. The heart of Jesus was moved with compassion for these dear people. They had stayed with him to witness his works and to hear his teaching for three whole days. And listen, whatever, whatever provisions they had brought, they had long been spent. There was no more food. There was nothing else to be found among the provisions of these people. They'd eaten it all, and yet they'd stayed with Jesus this whole time. And uh, kind of a convicting thing, um, if I preach over 30 minutes, people get upset. All right, These people with Jesus for three days. And I know what you're going to say, Pastor, you're not Jesus. And you're right, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll give you that, okay? And, uh, and so, uh, but anyways, they stayed with Jesus, and boy, he had compassion for them. He wanted to help them. He was not about to send them away without taking care of their physical needs as he had been taking care of their spiritual needs and I want you to understand, Jesus didn't just feel bad for these people. The emotion that Jesus was feeling caused him to want to do something to help. So often we say we have compassion when what we, what we really have is really just sympathy. But compassion is much deeper than that. Compassion is, is, a, is a deep type of sympathy that causes you, moves you to take action. To do something about the emotions that you're feeling. By the way, Jesus asks us as his disciples to have the same type of compassion to the hungry millions of people across this world who are perishing without Jesus Christ. It says in Jude verse 22, and if some have compassion, making a difference. That's the kind of compassion Christ tells us to have towards others. And so Jesus was burdened for these people who were hungry and about to perish. So he turns to his disciples. So notice what he said in verse 33. It says that his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And this just is astounding. These disciples, not, not months before, had watched Jesus feed the 5,000. And here Jesus turns to them and says, How are we going to feed these people? And they're looking around and they're saying, Jesus, where are we going to buy enough bread to feed all these people? I mean, it's, it's like they had already forgotten what Jesus had done for them in the past. And they asked the question that was very much like what the people of Israel asked of Jehovah God in the Old Testament when they were in the middle of the wilderness. In Psalm 78, verse 18, they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Well, these disciples are about to learn the same lesson the people of Israel learned. God can furnish a table in the wilderness. Doesn't matter where you are, Jesus can meet your need and he can serve your need. It just makes me think how prone we are to do the very same thing these disciples did. When we face a present day trial, we are so prone to forget how God has come through for us before. And forget that God can come through for us again. Because we're looking at our present situation and we're forgetting what God has done. Shame on us. I like what one person said. He said, forgetting former experiences leaves us under present doubts. If, you for, if you're doubting God today, it's because you've forgotten how God has come through for you before. These disciples come to Jesus with questions. How are we going to do this? Now, it could have been that these disciples asked Jesus this question because they were already suspecting what Jesus was going to do. But what we can conclude about the disciples' answer is that they openly admitted that they did not have what it took to meet the need that Jesus asked of them. They knew that in themselves and of their own resources, they could not meet this impossible need. By the way, I'll say this as well. That's the type of place that God wants to bring every one of us as one of Christ's disciples. It is not until you come to the end of yourself and you realize, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have the spiritual strength to be able to do what God requires of me. It is not till you come to that place that you can truly begin to live the Christian life as God intended for you to. Galatians 2.20 tells us to come to a place we learn to say, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. I can do all things through who, church? Christ, which strengthened me. And that's so important for us to understand. So the Bible said, Jesus, how are we going to do this? We can't do this. Going on in verse 34, notice what Jesus asks of them. In verse 34, he, Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have you? 
And they said seven and a few little fishes. Now they didn't have much, especially for a crowd that size. Listen, what they had was enough for Jesus to use. What they had wasn't enough for them to use to meet the need, but what they had to offer Jesus was enough for Jesus to use to meet the need. Let me tell you something. Listen, so much rich truth here. You may feel like you don't have much to offer God. That is not required. All that is required is for you to give Jesus a little bit you have and let Jesus do through it what you could never do through it. And these disciples said, we've got, a, we've got seven loaves and a few fishes. And Jesus said, well, bring him to me. Let me have him and I'll show you what I can do. And as the story unfolds, we see that when they gave Jesus what they had, he used it to do what only he could do. Notice in verse 35, the first thing he instructed them to do. In verse 35, he said he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. <coughs> I don't have time to expound this like I'd like to, but suffice it to say, what Jesus told them to do, the word sit down, it comes from a Greek word that means to lay down or to recline. In the Bible days, they, they, they didn't sit down at a table for a meal. They would, rec- they, would lay, they would lay down on their sides. And so when Jesus told these people, why don't you lay down on your side? They knew exactly what was about to happen. It's dinner time. I thought about bringing a dinner bell in here today for us, all right? But I thought some of you are already hungry enough by this point in the sermon, so I better not do that, okay? Um, but uh, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And they, they're looking at Jesus, and they see Jesus has a couple pieces of bread and some fish. And Jesus says, it's dinner time. Can you imagine what those people are thinking? What is this guy going to do? <laughs> what is he going to do now? What, what are you going to do with that? There's too many of us. There's all kinds of questions that could have been asked. But Jesus just told them to sit down and to trust him. And then in the sight of all those people, Jesus did something that cannot be explained in human terms. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, the Bible says he took the seven loaves and the fishes and he gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Boy, Jesus took those seven loaves and those few little fishes and he blessed them. He prayed for them. And he broke them. And then he began to give them to his disciples. And I can't fathom how this miracle took place. But what we do understand from what the scripture says is that the miracle took place in the breaking. Jesus would break off a piece and hand it to his disciples. He'd break off a piece and hand it to his disciple. And the bread never ran out. It never ran out. It multiplied miraculously in his hand. It's not like Jesus snapped his finger and all this food showed up. But boy, it, it, the, miracle, the miracle happened in his hands. Let me tell you something. Don't miss this. When you give your impossible situation and put it into the hands of Jesus, Jesus can do the impossible with your situation. If you put it in the hands of Christ, Christ can do with it what you cannot do. Jesus multiplied that bread, which was impossible for a man to do, and he did it, and he served all these people, and he supplied all these people with exactly what they needed. And boy, all those gathered at Jesus' table that day, figuratively speaking, they were served personally by Jesus Christ himself. Listen, nobody got a piece of food that didn't come from the hand of Jesus. And isn't it so true? James 1.17 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. I'm so thankful that all people who come to the table of Jesus will find that Jesus serves those who sit at his table. Listen, you don't come to the table of Jesus without being served by Christ. See, Jesus came into this world. Uh, Mark 10.45 says, not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Understand this. Jesus welcomes all those who come to his table to let him serve them. First off, by sacrificing himself for their sins so that they can have a place at his table. We didn't deserve that. But that's what Jesus does for every person who comes to his table. What a wonderful host he is. What a wonderful God he is to serve unworthy people like us. And let me say this. As Christ has served us, so he has called us to serve the unworthy and unwilling masses who are still in this world today. Jesus in John 13 says, I have given you an example that you should do for others even as I have done for you. 
And like Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and the disciples gave it to the multitude. Those of us who are believers, Christ has given us the bread of eternal life. And he's given it to us to be able to give it to the masses so that they cannot perish from the spiritual hunger that exists in their souls. In old church, God has given us a high and holy responsibility to share this wonderful bread of Christ with a world that is perishing without it today. So we see those who come to the table of Jesus, Jesus saves them. Jesus serves them. But the final truth I want us to see this morning is that at the table of Jesus, we find that Jesus satisfies. Jesus satisfies all those who come to his table. Look at verse number 37 and 38. We're almost done. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Verse 37, the Bible says, And they did all eat and were what? Filled. filled. And all eat and were filled, and they took up uh, the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men beside the women and children. Listen, every person who was fed by Jesus was filled. By Jesus. That, that word filled it comes from the Greek word pleres. It means to fill up to the top, to lack nothing, but we could say to be satisfied. You ever ate something, ate a meal, and you just had to sit back and you were satisfied? So you can say, Pastor, I'd like to be doing that right now. Okay? <laughs> we'll get there. All right, we're getting spiritually fed right now. We'll get to the other part here in just a minute. The point is, every person had everything they wanted to eat. They lacked nothing. They, uh, every person was as full as they could possibly be. And there was enough for everyone and more. How many baskets were left over? Help me out. Seven baskets. Seven baskets. Now this is incredible. I, I think this is fascinating. But we're almost out of time so I'll just summarize. In Matthew 14, at the feeding of the 5,000, the word for basket, the word translated baskets, because they had 12 baskets left over there. The word translated baskets is different than the word translated baskets here. Two different Greek words. And at the feeding of the 5,000, it, it was speaking of a small Jewish basket that they would use to carry their provisions around. It was a small basket. But here, the word used for basket is a word that speaks of a very large basket that the Gentiles would use to store all of their supplies. And you say, how big was it? Well, I'll say this. This same kind of basket is talked about in, in Acts chapter number 9 when they let the apostle Paul down over the wall of Damascus to let him escape from uh, the persecution that was coming his way. So it was big enough to fit the apostle Paul inside it. That's how big this basket was. And uh, uh, a lot of times we uh, minimize this miracle. But the truth is there was more than likely so much more left over after this miracle than there was left over at the feeding of the 5,000. But the point remains the same. Everybody had enough to fill them up, and there was still so much more that was left over once Jesus got done with what he was doing. Verse number 39, the Bible says that he sent the multitude, uh, sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Everybody went away full. Everybody went away satisfied. And I'm going to tell you, every person who comes to Christ always goes away satisfied. Every single time. Every single time. When you come to Christ, you will go away. You came empty, you will go away full. And so those who gather around Jesus' table, they will always find that Jesus is enough and more than enough for everything that they need. Matthew Henry, he put it this way. He said, with Christ, there are supplies of grace for more than seek it and for those that seek more. I like that. In other words, to translate that, we could say, hey, Jesus even has seconds for you. Amen? Amen. Some of you are seconds eaters like I am, you Baptist people. All right? Uh, but Jesus' supply will never run out. And it'll never run short. He's always going to have enough. And so whether you have a physical need, whether you have an emotional need, whether you have a spiritual need today, whatever your need may be, Jesus Christ is sufficient for it. And if you will bring it to him, he can satisfy the longing in your soul. Psalm 107 and verses 8 and 9 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. Listen, every single person 
who comes to Christ with that longing in their soul will find that their longing, their desire is satisfied in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. How sad it is that we try to find this satisfaction everywhere but Jesus. You try to find it in your job. You try to find it in your hobby. You try to find it in a sinful relationship. You try to find it anywhere and everywhere but Jesus. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 2 says, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Friend, you're not going to find satisfaction in anything else but Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you'll find, as he said in John chapter 6 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. And he that believeth on me uh, 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 shall never hunger and shall never thirst. He gives you a satisfaction that overcomes all the other things that you thought you wanted out of life. That's what Jesus Christ can do for your hungry soul today. And so I tell you, Jesus has a table spread to welcome all those who will come. And at that table, at the table of Jesus, he invites you to bring your trouble and lay it down at his feet. At the table of Jesus, he promises that he can save you. He promises that He will serve you and take care of your needs. And at the table of Jesus, He promises that He will satisfy the longing of your soul. And the great invitation is, why don't you just come? Why don't you just come and receive what Jesus has to offer? One more illustration and we're done. I thought about this this week. Every single phase of Jesus' ministry ended with the feast. When Jesus finished His Gentile ministry... The feeding of the 5,000 was the last thing that he did. Here, when Jesus finished his Gentile ministry, the feeding of the 4,000 is what took place. Then Jesus, as we'll see next, goes to Judea and starts his Judean ministry. Now, at the end of that ministry, it ends in an upper room with 12 of his disciples. Another feast. I was thinking about that and told a preacher friend about it. I thought it was so neat. And he commented, there's another feast coming, you know. And I thought, boy, that's good. <laughs> See, we are in a church age right now, but there's coming another feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And one more time, Jesus is going to gather all of us up around his table. And those of us that have believed in Jesus Christ will have a seat at that table and we'll celebrate the fact that Jesus saves and Jesus serves and Jesus satisfies. Praise God. Amen. The biggest question that you'll be asked to answer in your life is do you have a reservation at that table? Do you know when the end comes and God gathers all of his people around that table, will you have a place there? Because friend, if you don't know that for sure, I hope that you'll come. And let us take a Bible and show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and know that you have your reservation set for that final feast around the table of Jesus Christ. Believer, you know you have a place there. Some of you have been neglecting it. It's time for you to come bring your troubles and lay them at the feet of Jesus. He still welcomes you to his table.